This is PT Pro Talk, the podcast for physical therapists who want to improve their clinical skills and be more successful. I am Mariana Parts, physical therapist and your host, and today I'm joined by Dr. Ebony Rio, and she's going to talk about treatment of tendinopathies in the lower extremity. Ebony is a sports physio and a senior clinical research fellow at the Australian Ballet. Ebony is in the top 0.02% of tendinopathy researchers worldwide. In our discussion today, you're going to learn about the differential diagnosis and treatment progressions of Achilles, patellar, hamstring, and gluteal tendinopathies. If you feel this information is valuable, please consider subscribing to our channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up, and share with other clinicians you feel might benefit from this conversation. I hope you enjoy the show. PT Pro Talk podcast is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Systems for PT, the do anything, anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinics so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Looking for the highest quality equipment for your clinic? Turn to Fitter First. Our wobble, rocker, and slant boards are all assembled in North America to meet the demands of a busy professional clinic. Designed to adjust in seconds and made from the highest quality materials. Get the best Canadian-made rehab and balance products for your clinic. Order online for your clinic or for your clients. Ground shipping anywhere in North America. Visit fitter1.com. That's F-I-T-T-E-R, the numeral one, dot com. Hi, Ebony. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, I'm super happy that you uh, are here to share your expertise with us. So... Let's get started just talking a little bit about yourself and your career for the ones that don't know you. Sure. So I am a physiotherapist. So I'm a sports physiotherapist and I work at the Australian Ballet and the Victorian Institute of Sport. And I also split my time between research. Uh, so my joint position between La Trobe University and the ballet means I look after all of their, their research uh, so I love doing both. I think being a clinician and a researcher makes me stronger in both because I keep pushing myself to ask clinical questions and try and answer them. Yes, that's awesome. So you, you're feeling your, your, your difficulties on the practice and then you can go and research and find answers for those with your work. So that's very cool. Absolutely. That's one of the great ways. And, and physios do that really naturally because every person that you see, you're asking yourself questions, you're testing out a hypothesis, you're doing an intervention, you're reassessing, that's research. So every time you see someone, that's like an N of one research and you put enough of those little ideas together and, and you come up with research questions. So it's cool. Yes, very cool. Um, so... With you, we went over more the differential diagnosis of tendinopathy. So with you, um, uh, we were talking about treating more in depth about treatment. So what about we get started just since you are a clinician as well, that's going to be very helpful to go over like how would you maybe very briefly talk about differential diagnosis because you're going to have to just mention those and how would you start approaching those different diagnoses um, when you're treating your patients? Yeah, good question. So you get really helpful information um, by asking the right questions and really listening and, and really teasing out the detail. So I'll give you an example of the Achilles. So if we're talking about a tendinopathy, people with Achilles tendinopathy, either at the mid portion or the insertion, have really focal pain. And I'm talking about pain with load um, and it doesn't move or spread. I'm not talking about pain with palpation because that can be actually quite misleading. Lots of things can be tender. So they have quite focal pain. Um, they're irritated by high Achilles tendon load. So that's, um, you know, uh, stepping off curbs, walking, running, those sort of things. But a really critical question is, does your tendinopathy, does your pain warm up and tendons do, or does it get worse the longer you go? And if it gets worse, that's a real flag for it being a differential, for example, the peritendon. 
And what we need to do is make sure we really listen to our patients and our athletes, Mariana, because if you have a runner, you can think, oh, that's high Achilles tendon load. It must be tendinopathy. But the critical question there is the pain behavior. If they have pain at the start and it warms up and it's focal and it's worse the next day, that sounds like a tendon. But if they have pain um, the longer they run, what can be happening with that presentation is someone can start running, have reasonable calf capacity, and then as they fatigue, they actually go through more range of motion and they start to irritate the peritendon. So the person that gets worse the longer you go, you need to have a real flag up that it's something else. So differential diagnosis really comes down to pain location, uh, the loading type, and pain behavior. They're three really critical things. Okay. You just said a lot. So Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm just, let's see if I got everything. So if it gets worse as they progress, they are fatiguing and having more motion and then it's more peritendon, but it's still one of the tendinopathies classification, right? You just approach them differently, or it could be also a lot of other things. It, I, I don't consider them a tendinopathy. They can coexist, but you need to treat them differently, as you said. So, for example, if you think you have both, you need to treat the, the peritendon first, the, the sheath first, because anything that you give for the tendinopathy will irritate the sheath. So if you're not sure and it's a bit of a mixed picture, definitely settle down the peritendon first. And the way that I would do that would be to limit the provocative load and that's the movement. So that might be taking them off running at the moment if they're running, taking them off cycling or swimming, which is lots of repeated plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. You might recommend they wear a shoe with a really high heel so they don't go through as much range of motion walking around. So it's all about trying to reduce the peritendon load. So to give you an example, if you had someone with tendinopathy, you'd want to start them really early on calf raises, but you wouldn't give that exercise to someone with the peritendinitis because that is their provocative load. Does that make sense? Yes. So the classic tendinopathy, they would be the uh, the the mid tendon and the insertional tendon. Spot on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Spot on. Yep. And then what else would you use to differentiate those from the peritendum just by their mechanism of like injury and their how they behave with that pain? Yeah, they're the they're the classic thing. So the the loading type, so tendinopathy is really that elastic load, but peritendon is anything m- you know, range of motion. So that can be swimming, cycling, that won't irritate a tendinopathy, but it can definitely irritate the the peritendon. So the loading type is really important. Peritendon in terms of their presentation can be quite diffuse or quite vague in their pain location, whereas tendinopathy is very focal. Um, People can, you know, mid-portion, they tend to pinch either side of their Achilles insertion they tend to point with one finger Um, and then if you're considering your insertional tendinopathy they also have things like you know pain walking in bare feet because they get into compression because the tendon gets squashed against the bone okay and I remember that Jill also mentioned the plantar is that go together in that package the plantaris yes Yeah, so plantaris is a a very short muscle and a very long tendon, and most people have a plantaris. It's just there's a lot of different presentations as to the anatomy, and it's usually on the medial side, and in some people it can be inside the same sheath as the Achilles. So it can rub against the Achilles or it can compress against the Achilles. So clinically, their presentation is that their pain is more on the medial side, and it's often a little bit higher than the mid portion in terms of where people point. Um, and because it's a stiffer tendon than the Achilles, if the plantaris is involved in the presentation, they don't like being in dorsiflexion. So if they've been given the eccentric program off a step, for example, they've often done very badly because they've gone into compression. Okay. Very interesting. And then... Let's say we differentiate all those types. 
and now you're going to start treating them. So how would you treat each type sure. of tendinopathy? Let's start with our, our um, insertional Achilles. So uh, they hate being in dorsiflexion because the tendon gets squashed against the bone. So you, their provocative load is a lot to do with compression. So you need to take them off any stretching and you would encourage them to wear a shoe with a big heel on the outside of the shoe so that they don't get into dorsiflexion. You keep them out of compression. When you're getting them to do their exercises, you make sure they've got a vertical tibia and they're not dropping down into dorsiflexion. So just say you've given them a seated calf raise um, exercise, you make sure that they've got a perfectly vertical tibia and they're not dropping back into dorsiflexion. Same with if you're giving them a standing calf raise. And that's how I would start with someone with an insertional Achilles. Advice about removing the provocative load. Seated calf on each side, say for lots of six repetitions, depending on the athlete or the patient, um, single leg but each leg. Standing calf raises, um, weighted if you can, single leg but each leg, and also endurance calf raises. And all of that out of out of dorsiflexion. So that's our insertional Achilles. That's how I'd start with them. Okay. And you said no stretching, so you don't do any stretching. No stretching. So stretching provokes the tendinopathy because their their provocative load is compression. So stretching just um, irritates the insertion. Okay. Very interesting. And if people cannot tolerate those loads, you would start with just isometrics? Or do you feel like most people tolerate? Yeah, it's a really good question. So an isometric or an isotonic load is a really safe starting point for a tendinopathy because they're both a low load. Remember our tendons are provoked by things that are fast, our energy storage and our spring type load. So you can start your patients and your athletes on isometrics or isotonics. If someone's very fearful, isometrics can be really helpful. If they have a lot of pain, isometrics can be really helpful. But isotonic, so concentric, eccentric calf raises are very safe to start. Okay, so you would, if you start in isometrics, the goal is always to progress for more, with more load and then go to isotonics. The goal with isometrics is to use them um, in the beginning if you need for pain or for confidence, but you don't need to keep building up the load. You need to progress them to the isotonic exercise. So you might start with... For example, if you have someone with insertional Achilles, you'd get them to hold on for balance. They need to go up on two feet. They can transfer their weight to one foot if they can and hold for five lots of 45 seconds. For most people um, at home, that's enough load. So that's quite high load compared to what they can do. If you have an elite athlete, they might need to add weight. If you have someone that's more sedentary, they might need to do double leg. Um so you can start with isometrics, but you don't need to spend a long time on the isometric phase building up load. You need to get them going on the through range, remembering that that's really safe to transition into. So you can be doing both. You can be doing isometrics and isotonics really safely. If you have someone that's provoked by isometric or isotonic load, you need to go back to your differential diagnosis. For example, your sheath, your peritendon, because they're provoked by those loads. Okay. And you just mentioned about the right load. So uh, how do you know that's the right load for that patient? Yeah, good question. So in the clinic, um, what you'll do is, is just how you give any exercise, you look at the quality of the movement. So when I'm assessing someone um, in the objective assessment, I'll look at their calf capacity on each side, so their single leg endurance. And then what I'll do is that'll give me a bit of an idea as to what load I need to start them on. So if I have a high level athlete, for example, and they can already do, you know, 15 to 20 single leg calf raises, they will likely need more weight for the exercise. If you have someone that can do, you know, 10 to 15 exercises, um, single leg calf raises, then usually single leg holds are going to be sufficient. If someone can't even do... 10 on one side, double leg is going to be enough. If they can't even do five, you probably need to start below body weight with like a seated calf raise. Then once you're observing them do it, I tell them it needs to be 
um, it's a really safe flow, but it needs to feel heavy and heavy is what they can hold statically. If they're bouncing a lot, I'll drop the load. So if they're getting a lot of um, reverberation, I'll drop the load. If they tell me it's too easy, I'll increase the load. And people know after about 20 seconds if it's too easy or too hard. Yeah, okay. And you said that you don't go into dorsiflexion, right? So you stop like neutral or you even before getting to neutral? Yeah, so for the insertions, I'll keep them well away from dorsiflexion. So I might do, so for an isometric, they'll be up nice and high in plantar flexion. But even for an isotonic, I won't go below plantar grade for the okay. insertion. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then isometrics, any suggestion of like amount of time and repetitions that they hold? Yeah, so um, I tend to stick to what we used in our um, couple of research papers. So five lots of 45 seconds. Um, and if that's too easy and they can hold for longer, add load. You don't need to do um, longer than that. That's plenty. Okay. And then isotonics, do you have any protocols that you use? It, it definitely depends on what the person needs to be able to do, but we'll often do, um, if we're using weight, so for the seated calf raise and for the standing weighted calf raise, we might do, you know, four sets of six to eight repetitions. And then when we're doing just the body weight repetitions, um, we are looking to build up people's numbers. So we're looking for endurance And for people that want to just walk around and be active, we want at least 20 to 25. For athletes, we need at least 35. Okay, good. Um, and when you say 35 total or each, each set? Each, uh, well, that would be one set of 35 okay. in total. Yeah, That's single a lot leg, of repetitions. full height. Yeah. That is a lot of repetitions, but you think of how much work the calf does so when you're you know landing from a jump below the knee you absorb more than 60 of the energy so that's predominantly calf it's also long toe flexes and your foot spring so your calf needs to be exceptional not just for your achilles and your feet but also for your knees and hips and lower back so we need really strong calves yeah yeah good okay uh that's everyone all should pause we... there and do a set of calf raises And then restart the <laughs> recording. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else about the insertional? Oh, I have another question, actually. Do you ever go to eccentric or just stop at isotonics or depend of what they want to go back to, like function-wise? Yeah, really good question. So the four-stage program that we use um, starts with isometrics and then isotonics. And then we actually move into what we call energy storage and energy storage and release. So what that means is retraining the spring of the Achilles. So we don't separate out and do um, eccentric only. We incorporate eccentric movements into the isotonic. But then as we move into stage three and four, So an example for the Achilles might be um, we might progress the end of stage two, the end of um, the isotonic phase by starting some stairs. So walking up and down stairs, keeping your heel up um, and then progress through the pace. And as you get faster, you actually start to retrain the spring of the Achilles. So we might start at 90 beats per minute, which is quite isometric move up 100, 110, 130. By the time someone's doing 150, they are a little bit more springy and then you can progress the speed um, back, but we don't do eccentric only. Okay, interesting. Because there's a lot of people that always mention that study from, I think, Alfredson, right? Uh, yeah. About eccentric and then a lot of people just go crazy about eccentric. Standing up or just do eccentric, so... I think that's curious. That's why I wanted to ask yeah, you about that. Yeah, it's a good that. question. So we don't, um, if you just do eccentrics, you actually don't retrain the spring. And there's some fantastic work by Craig Purdom and others that have shown it, it, the difference between going from, say, small pulses or calf raises all the way up to sprinting. It's a huge increase in the rate of loading. And Mariana, tendons don't like change. So what we don't want to do is go from just a, 
a slow movement, concentric, eccentric, isometric, right up to a spring. They actually need those interim loads. They need that progression so that you build the tolerance of the tendon. So the the what we have to remember when we're reading research is you have to look at the start point of the people in the study and the end point. So if I do a 12-week eccentric program, at the end of the 12 weeks, I may not have returned to sport. Whereas when people come and see us, they have a functional goal, not a time-based goal. So, you know, we did a research study um, in season and we compared isometrics and isotonics over four weeks. And all our research question was which of these is is better or are they both well tolerated in season while people are doing um, training and games? But that's not a complete rehabilitation. That's a really specific question with a really specific time frame. So what I'd say is eccentrics have a role within um, the rehabilitation, but they're not a complete rehabilitation. Same goes for isometrics. You can't just do isometrics and then go back to sport or go back to activity. Tendons need progressive um, graded load. Okay. And then let's say we're treating an athlete. How do you know when it's ready to progress to a more like faster movement and like more load and impact? Yeah, really good question. So if we're doing rehabilitation, then we're assuming that they're not currently playing and training. So we've been able to remove their provocative load. They might have started with isometrics, but we've moved into isotonics. Their morning pain and stiffness is a good indication of how they're feeling um, because your morning pain and stiffness tells you about what you did the day before. So we're always interested in that 24-hour response. So the first thing is that our pain is low and stable. It may not be zero, but our pain is low and stable. Now, the second thing actually relates to their capacity. So we have objective measures of um, what we need them to be able to do before we progress. So if we have an athlete, our markers will be 35 single leg calf raises on each side. We would want them to be able to lift around three quarters of their body weight single leg in seated calf raise before lots of six. And usually around one body weight standing as additional load um, single leg for four lots of six. If someone can do that, we're really confident moving them into the stage three and four for that faster work. And we won't do that each day. We'll keep our strength work in and we'll do the faster work that you talked about every second or third day. So we've got the opportunity to listen to that next day response. Mm-hmm. And like those exercises that you, when you are rehabbing someone, do they do every day? Or do they need like a break to rest? Yeah, good question. When we're doing the strength work, we'll do that um, every every two or three days uh, or alternate days. And that way we're well set up for when we start to add in the faster work because that'll be on the non-strength days. So an example might be we might do our strength work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then as we move into stage three and four, the spring work, the faster work goes Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and they can have Sunday off. Okay. Sounds <laughs> good. And it's it's good because you said that in 24, 24 hours, you want to see how they behave. So you have still those days to see if your load's good for the strengthening portion, right? You nailed it. Spot on. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. That's all about the insertion now. Let's jump to the next one. <laughs> No worries. Um, Actually, I forgot one of the differentials down at the insertion. That would be the superficial bursa. So people with insertional Achilles um, that point with one finger, you know, down towards the insertion, as we said, from a behavior point of view, they don't like walking around in bare feet because they get into compression. Whereas the superficial bursa is the bursa that sits between the tendon and the skin down at the calcaneus. So it's not part of the musculotendinous unit which means they actually prefer to be in bare feet because their provocative load is their shoe rubbing or compressing. So the person that says to you, I can't wait to take my shoes off and I'm way better in bare feet, just be aware that it could be the superficial bursa. Okay, good point. All right, what was the next tendon? What are we up to? Mid-portion? Oh, the, the mid, yeah, mid-portion. Mid-portion, beautiful. So if we were going to do an isometric for the mid-portion, we don't need to be in full plantar flexion. 
Um, and in fact, we try and get them into, say, mid-range or even plant a grade for a mid-portion for their isometric. Um, for isotonic, we don't mind if they go into a little bit more dorsiflexion. Um, so you don't have to worry about the tibial angle as much as you do with the insertion. And if someone – so that, but the actual um, – Prescription is quite similar in terms of the isometric 5x45, um, the isotonic um, seated and standing, and also the endurance. Very similar. The, the, just the, different the, advice. And the difference would be just the angle. You can play a yeah. little bit more into the RC flexion and the rest is very similar. Yeah, spot on. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Anything else to add on the, on this one? Um, only that if you have someone with a suspected mid portion and they're not tolerating, um, the, uh, isotonic, just say you do have them going into a little bit more dorsiflexion, just recheck that you don't think you've got a plantaris or a sheath. So if someone's worse, if you suspect tendinopathy and they are worse in stage one and two, isometric and isotonic, you have to go back and wonder why because they're both very safe loads for tendinopathy. Anything static or slow is easy for a tendon. Um, it, tendons are about rate of loading. So if someone is worse in stage one and two, you just have to have your antenna up for there being something else going on, like that plantaris might be compressing the tendon as you're going into dorsiflexion. So it's all about listening to your patient or listening to your athlete and just making sure um, we're responsive. And is there any time frame that you would expect someone to get better? So, for example, when you're saying that maybe they don't get better on stage one and two, do you have any timeline that you like expect to see some difference? And then if they don't get better, you start to think about maybe the diagnosis is wrong. Yeah, so in stage one and two, you should be seeing a, a change quickly for two reasons. The first thing is, is that you've removed their provocative load. So if we're talking about rehabilitation and not in season, I can talk about in season management in a moment. But if we're talking about rehabilitation, your advice should be about removing the provocative load. And because you're removing the provocative load and starting them on safe loads, you look to see an improvement in their symptoms quite quickly. So if someone's not improving or they're getting worse, you know, I would be really questioning my diagnosis in under two weeks, sometimes one session. So we, we might even do a set of, say, heavy isometrics and look at someone's response or isotonics because they shouldn't provoke a tendinopathy. So you can even look within a session. Okay, very good. And then as they progress and get better, then you will slowly start to move then into more dorsiflexion as you progress and they feel better. So it's just like in the beginning that you're avoiding that provocative movement. Spot on. So in the beginning, we want to take out the provocative movements, but we want to start to um, add those loads back in because people need to be able to, you know, move move through range. Um, and same with their footwear. If we gave them advice about being in a shoe with a really high heel, we'd start to bring them down so they can get back into their normal footwear. But the key thing is you really want to change one thing at a time. Because if you change three or four things and they're worse, you won't know what it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point too. Um, okay, let's move on to the peritendon. Sure. So the peritendon, again, first thing is remove the provocative load. So all the advice needs to be around moving excessive plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. So that means um, taking them off cycling, swimming, anything where they're just moving through range. If they're currently running and they have peritendinitis, then they, they clearly don't have the capacity and running is just provoking their um, irritation. So number one, remove the provocative load. Number two, try and get them in shoes with a big high heel at the back so that they're not going through as much range of motion walking around. Think about how you walk around in your high heels. You actually want to stay in quite a stiff ankle position if you can. Then unlike a tendinopathy, I don't give isometrics or isotonics. I might start with isotonics on their unaffected side because that's going to help me with cross-education. So that's the concept of strength training one side and getting some transfer over onto the other side. 
But what I'll, what I might start them with relatively early is going up and down stairs, keeping their heel up. If you keep your heel up on stairs, it's quasi isometric, but it's not um, really heavy, so it doesn't sort of bunch up the peri tendon because the actual time under tension isn't very long. So they don't go they don't go well with prolonged isometrics. Um, it sort of bunches up the peri tendon and they're irritated. So heavy isometrics can help you with your differential diagnosis. But what they do tolerate really well is stair walking. So 90 beats per minute, heel up on the way up, on the way down. But the key thing is they're not going through range. They're not bouncing. They have to be really, really stiff. Um, on the way up, get them to hit the metronome beat. On the way down, just make sure they're safe. Some people can really struggle with the coordination of coming downstairs on the ball of their foot. So get them to hold on, make sure they're safe. Don't worry about the speed to begin with. So it's a really safe exercise for a peritendon. There are some creams that you can use depending on um, whether or not they've been okay by their doctor. So I usually get people to speak to their doctor or their pharmacist. Um, in Australia, the two creams are sold as Voltaren gel and Herodoid cream. So Herodoid is a bruise cream and they actually have a, a an interaction and they stop the, um, the crepitus. You know how you get that sort of gritty, sandy... Um, irritation between the tendon and the sheath you get the adhesions that's what the creams do and people can um, if it's okay with their doctor slather that on their tendon wrap it overnight it also stops them moving around a lot at night and um, that can help as a treatment but it's not a magic cure if you don't remove the provocative load it's pretty ineffective and you don't and you don't need it you can manage these without okay and when you say about the shoe lifting, like the heel, how do you do with men? Like, do you put like something inside your shoes or because with women, I guess it's a little bit easier. Just use something with a little heel or do you do anything specific for that? Like, how do you manage that? So there, there is a footwear company in Melbourne that actually make, make shoes that have an internal high heel at the back and they're for men that want to appear taller. So we have had people go and buy those shoes, but often we'll just send them to a boot maker and they'll just get a little wedge put on the sole of their shoe. The problem with going inside the shoe is if you go up too high, you actually push the person up out of their shoe and it can irritate the back of the heel or the bursa on the, on the heel counter. So we do try and go external. Some of the boots um, that you can buy are, uh, for for men have more of a heel at the back um so we just try and see what we can do but it's definitely much easier for women <laughs> and like how many centimeters or inches that you recommend in that case yeah it depends on um how provoked they are so sometimes so what you can do is if they've got pain just standing in um just standing you can put some towels underneath their heel and see how high you go before they're pain-free. Um, but it, often it's two to three centimetres. Okay. Okay. Good. So it's quite high, which yeah. means you can't get that high with the little things inside your shoe. Yeah, so that maybe a boot would be better. I don't know in the summer, but uh, uh, <laughs> a boot should be fine. Uh, or those, um, those thongs with the high heels. You know, have you seen the thongs with the high heels? I don't think so. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and and when you said about the pace going up, that do you, do you have like a pace that you recommend when you're walking upstairs on your toes? Yeah, so we start at ninety beats per minute. That tends to be um, pretty well tolerated for most people. So that would be for my peri tendon. Um, and then even once you start the stairs for the tendinopathy, I'd start at ninety beats per minute. Remembering with the peri tendon, once. Um, we've settled down the sheath, we need to address the underlying dysfunction. And the underlying dysfunction is calf capacity. So I can't just do stairs and then send them back to running because I haven't addressed their through range strength. So I would progress from stairs to small range calf raises before I did a full range calf raise. So um, I might do a couple of weeks of stairs make sure I've settled down the peritendon and I can check that with a stethoscope to see whether or not I can hear the crepitus. Um, so that can help me in diagnosis, but also in monitoring 
um, putting a stethoscope over the tendon. Then I would start with um, small range calf raises with um, weight and small range calf raises with their body weight and then progress through there to a full range calf raise. And then I'd have the same requirements around their capacity if they're an athlete. So getting back to 35 calf raises before I added in any of the faster stuff. Okay. And how about the plantaris? Is that similar to the peritandum? How would you manage those? Yeah, good question. So you actually might want to manage it similar to the insertion. So what I mean by that is you really care about the dorsiflexion angle. You want to stay away from the dorsiflexion angle. You can have an irritation of the plantaris within the sheath. So if they've got quite diffuse ray, um, pain or you've got crepitus on that medial side, I'd manage them like a peritendon, spot on. Okay. Um, anything else about Achilles? And your if, you, and- if you're not sure and you think you've got maybe a bit of peritendon and maybe a bit of tendinopathy, manage them like a peritendon first. Remove the range um, and just go slowly and progress them back that way because anything you just direct at the tendon like isotonics will bother the peritendon. So if you're not sure, manage them like a peritendon. But it, it can be really tricky. It can be mixed, you know, these bursa down there there's the sural wave you can definitely have lots of things going on so that can be that can be tricky yeah and then do you do other like the address other strengthenings with that do you do you use anything else that is helpful in those cases other than just addressing specifically the tandem problem yeah so yeah it's a really good opportunity to address anything else in the whole leg that might be an issue so remember the person in front of you might have had you know a previous acl injury and they may not have recovered their quad their quadricep or they might have had a past history of bone stress in their feet and they might have really weak foot intrinsics so that's where the individualization comes in so in their first stage of strengthening with isometric and isotonic, they actually get a full program because this whole human needs to go back. So they'd never just get calf. They'd likely also get, you know, leg press, you know, whatever else they need for hamstring, quad, adductor. So it's really important that it's it's tailored and it's individual. Okay. Anything uh, else well, before yeah. we move to the knee? Hmm. Anything else before we move to the knee? No, I think I'm pretty happy with that, except to say, sorry, there is one more thing. With with your Achilles or with any of your tendons, you want to make sure you're really thinking about that person's end point where they need to be able to go. So if you have someone with insertional Achilles that wants to run a long way, then the progressions are about endurance. And so you might get them to do stairs, but like progressing through lots of stairs, or you might start them with some skipping and then progress, you know, for time. Whereas if you have a basketball athlete, they might, they also need to do lots of change of direction. So you need to include those in your stage three and four um, exercises. So you just want to make sure it's really tailored and it's really individual based on what they want to be able to do. Yes. And then it goes to this part specific movements that they use in all those tests. Okay. Spot on. Yep. Now, how about knee? How would you start treating uh, tendinopathy? Okay, so let's think of the most common um, presentation, which is pain at the inferior pole. And it, again, is really focal with high patellar tendon loads. So high patellar tendon loads are, you know, maximal jumping, you know, big lunging change of direction. But remembering that, those two movements can also irritate patellofemoral joint pain. So sometimes the information that you get around the loads that do and don't provoke your athlete can be really beneficial. So I'll give you an example. If you have someone with anterior knee pain, I might say, does it hurt to cycle? Because it won't bother the patella tendon, but it might bother the patellofemoral joint pain. I might say, does it hurt to just go for a jog? Because jogging is not high patellar tendon load, so it won't bother your patellar tendon, but it might bother your patellofemoral joint pain. Because a lot of the movements that you do provoke both, so you want to know about the specific high tendon load ones. 
So changing direction is huge patellofemoral joint load. You get a huge amount of compression. And that's why we see anterior knee pain or patellofemoral joint pain really commonly in basketball and volleyball. It's not all jumper's knee. So it's really specific um, focal inferior pole pain with very high load and it doesn't move or spread which also means the person in front of you can give you a lot of information about how likely it is. If they're a runner, very unlikely to be patella tendon. If they're a swimmer, it's not going to be patella tendon. Um, if they're a basketball or a volleyball or a tennis athlete, you might have more suspicion, but you still need to, to check. So it's predominantly young, male, high-level jumping athletes that we see. Okay, and would change of directions also provoke the tandem are not as much it can yeah definitely particularly if it's fast so as you go into um changing direction and your tibia comes over your ankle it's actually your patella tendon that can spring you back the other way so that's why decelerations and change of direction provokes our tendons but it can also provoke the joint so we've just got to be really careful with our questioning yeah yeah it's very important to get these diagnosed right so then it's not your plan Spot on. And how would you start managing the patellar tendon? Yeah, so remembering someone with our patellar tendinopathy is usually a young male jumping athlete, so we they need to be in the gym. So we don't need to worry about um, coming up with home exercises because they are elite athletes and they need to be in the gym and they need to make sure the rest of their kinetic chain is good enough. So the exercises that they would get is I usually start my way up from the bottom. So remember I said before they need excellent calf. So it's actually the soleus that decelerates the tibia and helps you propel back the other way. So they would get seated calf raise they were with weighted single leg but each leg, standing calf raise, seated, uh, sorry, single leg but each leg. They'd get isolated quadriceps and the best way to do that is a leg extension machine because you can't use anything else um, you can't find a way to cheat the way you can with a squat or some sort of other multi-joint exercise. So that would be single leg. If you're going to do isometrics, it would be at around about mid-range, say 45 to 60 degrees, five lots of 45 seconds, and heavy is what they can do well without the reverberation. Um, if you're going to also add in isotonics or go straight to isotonics, it would be through whatever range they can do comfortably. Um, people with patellar tendinopathy don't like having their knee out completely straight. No one knows the reason for that. It's very odd that they don't. So I, I just get people to go through range and it's nice and slow. So three seconds concentric, four seconds eccentric for, you know, four lots of six to eight. I'd also add in, say, a leg press um, and whatever else they needed for, you know, hamstring, adductor, glute. The reason I add a leg press in is it's one of the metrics that we use for returning to faster work for the patella tendon. So remember, these are predominantly jumping athletes. So before we get them back doing faster movement, they need to be at a leg press one and a half times their body weight on each side for four lots of six. Okay. Are you surprised okay. by that? You look surprised. Yeah, no, it does a lot. It has a lot of um, it is a lot. repetitions. Um, and then if they are more sore on the next day, they, would you think that you may overload them? Or like they, you would know right away, like if they're going to feel like right away if it's too much load? So remember, because this is slow or static, it won't provoke your tendon. So if you have someone that is worse at the time and worse the next day, I'd be thinking it's patellofemoral joint because the leg extension gets a lot of patellofemoral joint compression. So people that are worse on the leg extension, that is a big flag for it being the joint. Okay. So yeah, if they get worse, you can think that maybe you got it wrong, the diagnosis. Yeah. And and again, if you think you have a bit of both, manage them like a joint. Uh-huh. Okay. And, and manage the patellofemoral joint. Yep. And you just progress load as they tolerate. You start increasing load as they tolerate. Yep. So okay. remember, anything slow or static is easy for a tendon. might be hard for the muscle and it might be hard for the joint, but it's easy for the tendon. So stage one and two that are static and slow won't provoke your patellar tendons. 
So if that person's worse, you need to recheck your diagnosis. Okay, awesome. Um, anything else about the knee? So if you do have um, patellofemoral joint pain, because they still need quadriceps and, you know, they still need load, people will often say, well, then what do we do? Like if they're not tolerating, you know, leg extension, what I might do is play around with the diamond tape. So that's, there's, uh, it's, a, it's one of the tapes for the um, patella, but it's not one where you're gliding or rotating. It's where you actually do a diamond shape around the kneecap and the landmarks are tib tube, the two joint lines, and then you're about two fingers away from the kneecap all the way around and you're trying to sort of squish the tissues together so that the kneecap sort of sits up a little bit. So there's some videos on YouTube that people have made. What I try and do is try that and see if it helps them tolerate their uh, exercises or if they've got pain just in you know, activities of daily living, they can walk around with it on. Um, And what I'll say to people is try and keep the load as high as you can and reduce the range. So even if you're just going through a small range, because depending on where the irritation is, there'll be parts of the leg extension that feel more comfortable, same with leg press, than others. Some of the ranges won't be comfortable. So just modify the range. Okay. And that's for the... Patellar femoral pain that you're talking that's about. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Okay. Um, anything else that you want to add before we go to a hamstring? So just one thing that can also help you in terms of your differential between um, the different types of anterior knee pain. When someone with patellar tendinopathy hops, they hop with a really stiff knee because they actually don't want to um, use their patellar tendon like a spring. So they stay out of knee flexion. Whereas someone with patellofemoral joint pain, you see that valgus and you get a lot of knee bend. So watching someone hop can be really beneficial. People with patellofemoral joint pain need far more work around the hip. So research has shown that they have a lot of valgus and issues with their hip, but people with patellar tendinopathy don't. You see a very different hopping strategy. Okay. So any other advice for patellofemoral pain treatment-wise? Um, look at the hip. Look at the hip. Don't forget the calf. The, there's some evidence for orthotics. Taping can help. Just whatever techniques you need to be able to sort of find a way to break the cycle of pain because they need strengthening as well. It can just be hard to find a way in, whereas tendons are actually quite easy because you can do isometrics or isotonic. But patellofemoral joint pain, it can be really hard to find a start point for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's move to hamstring. Um, okay. How do you manage those? So um, hamstring, there are two kind of classic presentations for hamstring tendinopathy. So the first most common one are people that have pain in hip and trunk flexion. So if you're, if you're bending over, so that might be um, hockey athletes that are running or fast bowlers and their compression is when the um, tendon is squashed against the ischial tuberosity and so in that, that forward trunk flexion. The second presentation that's a bit less common is when you actually have a bit of a drop with a trend Allenberg. So you might see race walkers and that's because it's actually um, the semimembranosis that comes around and because of the path it travels, as you drop, it gets compressed on the on the side of the ischial tuberosity. So you can see two hamstring presentations. You can see people that have pain in like a arabesque, like leaning forward type movement, or you can see people that have pain when they drop their pelvis. And you can see that in runners if they land on one leg and have a lot of drop, they can have pain that way. So my advice is work out which one it is in your assessment. So work out if they have a lot of pain um, and remember it's focal pain. So my assessment might take them through like double leg forward bend into single leg forward bend um, and getting them to show me where their pain is. Then I might get them to do a combined energy storage, so running up to a chair, dipping in really quick and coming out. So that's energy storage for the hamstring tendon but in compression. 
Um, you might take them through a series of bridging where you're moving the thigh into more hip flexion and look at their pain. And you also might just look at them hopping because someone with um, the Trendelenburg will be provoked with hopping because it's a lot of um, friction as they land on that leg, uh, sorry, compression as they land on that leg. And then my next thing would be um, remove the provocative load. So it's the same message. What's my provocative load? For the hamstring, remember it's predominantly hip flexion. So you want to go through their um, gym program and you want to take out anything into hip flexion. So a deadlift or a squat or a leg press because all of those things will keep the tendon sensitive but you don't want them to rest. So you need to replace those exercises with things in hip neutral, like prone um, hamstring curl um, for the hamstring. Um, remember, the calf is really important. So it's it's still about the whole kinetic chain. The advice around removing hip flexion in everyday life can be tricky because we all have to sit. So I've got, a, I've got a good little tip from Professor Craig Purdom. If you roll up a towel, and you put it just forward of the back of the chair, then actually your your sit bones, your ischial tuberosity should be suspended. You sort of sit on your hamstrings. So what you avoid is the direct pressure of the chair. And then if people have an office chair, what they can do is they can actually angle it down so you're in less hip flexion. Does that make sense? You can angle the seat down. So... Um, it's great if people can sit less, but some people have to sit, you know, they have to commute or whatever it is. The other thing is just reassuring people. Sitting is the last thing to get better. So it's, and sometimes people feel better knowing that, that that'll actually stay sensitive for a while. So they, they become less um, worried that that's still an issue if you reassure them that that's a very slow thing to improve. So you'll see a lot of other improvements before sitting improves but remove their provocative load. Again, no stretching because you're just compressing the tendon against the issue of mm-hmm. tuberosity. Mm-hmm. So it, and, and it's so important to take out as much provocative load as you can in the beginning because if you're keeping it a little bit sensitive, even if they're doing all the right things, they can be really frustrated that they're not moving forward. So that removal of provocative load is really important. It's as important as starting the safe loads. Yeah. And when you said in the beginning, the bridge, so you should expect them to have pain when they are bridging, doing bridge? Yeah, so just say I get someone to lie on their back and I have um, their their shin up on my shoulder and their other leg is off the bed, just they're holding it up. If I get them to single leg bridge, pushing through my shoulder, as I move them into more hip flexion, they have more and more pain because the tendon is more compressed. So that is that is a really common clinical assessment, um, and the more compression they're in, the more sore they'll be. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if you would do like an isometrics to see if the pain goes down, how would you do that for the hamstring? Yeah, there's lots of options. So if they're at home, you could do a long leg bridge, so their feet up on a small box with um, a neutral pelvis. So you could do a long leg bridge if they're in the gym. You could do um, the, say, prone hamstring curl, um, so again, a neutral pelvis. You can also do, it's called the Bosch or the glute ham raise, but again, so you lie on your stomach over a bolster and you hold um, your leg hooks underneath a bar and you sort of hold in a plank position. You're holding your body, but again, it's the key thing with each of these is you're in hip neutral. Uh-huh. So you would start with isometrics? Usually managing those, like yeah, you can definitely mentioned. start with. Yep, you can definitely start with your isometrics and then um, progressing them into your isotonics as well. But yep, isometrics for hamstring are really easy at home because it's just a bridge on a small box. So very simple. And as you progress, you also try to stay just in neutral, the hip in neutral. So early on, um, so similar to we talked about removing the provocative load for the other tendons, we remove it early, but then we want to start to add it in because we we do have a um, you know someone that wants to run up and down hills or play hockey, they need to be able to get into hip flexion. So we'd start to introduce that as they get stronger. We'd start to add a little bit of that in and see how they tolerate it, listening to their next day pain. Okay. 
Um, anything else about the the hamstring? I think the progression is similar as we talked about. The progression about the is others. similar. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, spot on. So it's the same concepts for each. It's understanding the provocative load and removing it, starting with your safe load, so your isometric and isotonic, and then slowly increasing the spring once the person has the capacity. Um, The only other thing with the hamstring is it can – you've got to be confident that they don't have like a sciatic nerve irritation um, that you need to manage. And I'm really, I mean, I don't love um, injections like blood injections for any of the tendons, but I particularly don't like it for the hamstring because if you inject platelet-rich plasma into the hamstring tendon and it swells, it can actually adhere to the sciatic nerve and then they need to go to surgery. So I don't I don't love PRPs for any tendons because they're not well supported with evidence. But we also need to remember it's not, did it work or didn't it? There's also sometimes some negative consequences. And for the hamstring, that's definitely one. Okay, good. Um, Anything else before we move to the last one? Nah, let's move on. Glutes? (laughs) Glutes. Okay, so um, I'm sure Jill would have said that the most common presentation is our postmenopausal women. Um, They have the, you know, characteristic lateral hip pain. We've said for all our other tendons that, Bless you. We've said thank you. <laughs> We've said for all our other tendons that um, the pain is quite focal. The gluteal tendon um, is our exception to the rule, and the gluteal tendons are the exception to a couple of the the rules or the guidelines that I've told you. The first one is they can have quite a bit of referral down the leg. It's usually not past the knee. There's a lot of big bursa around, so that's why we think they can get that referral. Um, we there's a number of um, studies that have shown some different uh, assessment techniques. So one of them, for example, just standing on one leg because they get the compression of their stance leg because they drop into that Trendelenburg. Um, but the characteristic pain behavior they'll describe is a lot of night pain. It's the only tendon to give you night pain. And it's because they're lying on it or they're dropping their top leg into adduction. So night pain is really common. Um, and, you know, age and, and sex are two really big indicators as well. Um, so, you know, other differentials would be, you know, hip osteoarthritis or lumbar. But remembering that people can have multiple things. They might have a really grumpy hip joint and gluteal tendinopathy. Um, remember that we don't get an isolated bursitis. So if you have someone with gluteal bursitis, they also have gluteal tendinopathy. And the implication is we can't just inject the bursa because their pain will come back. You have to address the compression of the tendon around the greater trochanter. So we described it as being postmenopausal women, and that's because of the drop in female sex hormones. But it's more commonly women because of our greater Q angle and the greater compression of the tendon around the greater trochanter. So what we want to do is start them with, uh, they, they actually go really well with some isometrics. So an isometric that I might start them on is holding on for balance. So they're not sort of wobbling all over their leg. And if you get them to stand on their symptomatic leg and hitch their hemi pelvis up one inch and hold, that's isometric for their stance leg out of compression because I'm actually hitching up my hemi pelvis. It's very functional because that's actually what you need to be able to do. You to be able to stand on one leg without your pelvis dropping. So I said before that we aim for five lots of 45. Often these women can't do it. So I'll often do five sets of whatever they can do as my start point. The other thing that I said to you multiple times is do everything single leg but each leg. Again, women with gluteal tendinopathy to begin with are our exception we give them everything on two legs. Because if I give them calf raises on one leg, they drop into compression. If I give them a single leg squat, they're just continually compressing that tendon. So what you might do is say, well, we need some work for the whole kinetic chain, but we're going to start on two legs. So you might start them with double leg sit to stand from a chair, keeping their knees apart. Because you're going to pick up some quadricep, you're going to pick up some glute, but you're out of compression. You might start them on double leg calf raises 
again, you're out of compression, but you're going to help them with their ability to sort of walk and uh, go downstairs and sort of take their weight. Because if you don't improve the kinetic chain, just say you're going downstairs, if your quadricep is really poor, you actually drop into a lot of compression as you descend stairs. Whereas if your quadricep is really good, you can keep yourself out of compression. So kinetic chain is still really important for these women. We just can't start on one leg at a time. When we're removing the provocative load, that's around the advice. So I might say, um, you know, try not to sit with your legs crossed. Um, try to walk with your um, a bit of a wider base of support and don't sort of stand hanging on one hip. Yeah. Okay. And then you progress with them. And at some point you do single leg or you'll never do? Like when they're able to, do you progress to single leg? Yes, I do. Because everything we do as humans, we do on one leg at a time. So walking up and down stairs, you know, we need people to be really functional. So I start people on double legs. So they might start on isometrics with double leg um, sit to stand and double leg calf raises. The other great thing about the double leg sit to stand is if their hip or their knee is not very good, you can just use a higher chair. So you can sort of make that really adaptable to the person in front of you. Um, give them a really good advice of, about removing compression. So Charlotte Ganderton, um, all of the supplementary files um, gives all of the education that they gave women with gluteal tendinopathy. So that's a great resource. Um, then what I might do is stand on one leg. I've, I've hitched up that hip and I, then I might do repeated steps onto a box. So I'm sort of progressing my endurance for my gluteal tendon or my glute med. I might sort of hitch one leg and swing the other side. That's quite challenging. Um, so that would be really difficult to do. And then something like stairs actually mean you need to control your hemipelvis and not get into compression so you can progress women back to stairs as well. Okay. And they probably are older women, so you don't have to progress them much further to more at athletic levels. Yeah, it depends. Some some of the women that I've treat, treated want to get back to running. So then they'd need to get back to all of the same requirements around calf capacity. Um you know, skipping and hopping and then progressing back through a running program. So you're right, it completely depends on what their goals are. Absolutely. So it's really tailored. And that's why we can't just use a recipe from the from the literature. Yeah. Okay. Anything else before we wrap up the the treatment part? I think so just to kind of round it out, the four questions of self-efficacy that Professor Laura Mosley talks about, that's, what I, that's how I like to frame my education. So the words we use are really important. And every time we're using a term, people are updating their understanding of what they think they need to do about that condition. So if you're saying, oh, you know, your tendonitis will get better, well, people's underlying um, belief if you're using that term or they're using that term is that it's inflammatory. So you can write the world's best exercise program and there's actually a disconnect between what they think they need and what you're giving. So don't don't allow people or don't allow yourself to use terms that are inaccurate and misleading because they're actually not helpful and they're not innocuous. They actually have a, a, an effect so make sure you're using terms like tendinopathy. So our four questions of self-efficacy, uh, people want to know what is wrong with me. So give a really good evidence-based description of what is wrong with me. People want to know the, in really simple terms, uh, what can you do about it? What can I do about it? And how long will it take? And that's how I frame my education. And the what can you do about it? Well, um, you know, it's tendons are about load and exercise and so what you can do about it is your program what can I do about it teach you support you help you progress teach you when to listen to your tendon how long will it take we map that out based on where they are now and what they want to be able to do so if you have a ultra marathon runner that can do six calf raises and they want to run 100 kilometers we've got a long way to go and we know that that's going to take months to get the strength and then months to regain the spring. So you can give people an estimate based on what you've seen in your objective assessment. 
Um, Because we know that if they're very weak, we know from the literature that that's going to take at least three months of strength training. And then on top of that, the sports-specific stuff that you talked about. So based on the distance between where they are and where they need to be, you can give them a bit of a guideline. But I tell people it's not a time-based rehabilitation. It's all about objective measure, progression. So if they go away and do the work and it's quicker, I won't hold them back because of time. Okay. And... Do you have these like protocols anywhere that you use these numbers? Is that like published or is it just something that you use for yourself? Um, we wrote th this definitely, we've definitely got it in a couple of papers. So the isometric and the isotonic stuff is definitely out there. And then we wrote a paper. Um, so Peter Meliaris is the lead author of that one. Um, and Jill and Perds and I are on the paper. Um for patellar tendinopathy, I think that's got a bit more of an outline. And then the breeder study, B-R-E-D-A, so they, um, they're a Dutch group and they consulted with Jill and I and did a study in patellar tendinopathy and that basically goes through the stages as well. So you can definitely find um, some of the resources. Okay, good. Um, anything else before I transition to the final questions? No, I think I've talked your ear off. I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was awesome. Uh, so just any resource of information you recommend if people want to learn more about the topic, is that anything that you recommend them? Yeah, so there's, there's actually um, quite, quite a few podcasts like this, which I think are a really nice way of listening to it and and hearing the information multiple times in multiple different ways. I think there's some great infographics that people have developed online. The La Trobe Sport and Exercise Medicine Research website, we're looking at producing and having available a lot of free resources so people can keep an eye on that as well. Awesome. And any advice to clinicians that are starting their careers? Yes, I have two pieces of advice. My first one is I love being a physio. And so if you're in a um, clinical environment that you're not enjoying, consider changing your job and not your profession because it's actually a great, a great profession with a lot of opportunities. And so if you're really unhappy, just consider it that it may not be um, everything, it might be where you are. And I say that to new graduates all the time because a lot of physiotherapists leave the profession within five years. And I think that's a tragedy because we we have a lot of smart young people that don't stick with physio because they get burnt out and overworked and don't enjoy it. So find good clinical mentors, have good peer support, you know, make sure you keep your hobbies up. And if you're really unhappy, really Get some advice about maybe changing your job, but not not your profession. It's a great profession. Yeah, I agree. Um, and last question, any personal qualities or abilities that you think are important to become a successful physical therapist? Oh, that's a good question. I think um, it would have to be the ability to listen would have to be number one. Because true listening and that active listening, you get all of the um, verbal cues, obviously, and you get a lot of information, but you learn a lot from the nonverbal as well. So you start to read um, people's kind of feelings and, and manner. So I think the ability to listen and show genuine empathy, but not sympathy, um, sympathy can create a real power imbalance and that's not what we're after. We're looking to work with our patient and our athlete and empower them. But I think you can be highly empathetic for what they're going through and just show them that you're on their team. That's what we're doing. We're here. We're here for them. Awesome. Uh, Ebony, if anyone wants to uh, find more information about you or contact you, I know you probably don't like many social medias, but how <laughs> I'm not on social media. Yeah, yeah. Um, anywhere that they can contact you? I joined LinkedIn. Does that oh, count? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're all LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've recently joined LinkedIn, but I don't even know the password for my Twitter account to cancel <laughs> it. That's how long it's been since I've been yeah. on there. Oh, I forgot one more thing. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my other piece of advice is just really be thoughtful about being evidence-based 
And evidence-based doesn't mean taking the next paper that comes along and throwing out everything you've done before. So let me give you an example of how to be evidence-based. There's really good research for tendinopathy for heavy slow resistance. So the Kongsgaard paper um, for the knee and the Bayer paper for the Achilles tendon. But they're both double leg. And if we just use that as a recipe, then what we're actually doing is discarding the research by Jamie Gator and others that have shown that people are asymmetrical. So what we want to do um, is take the evidence that we know we need to do single leg but each leg, layer on heavy slow resistance. So use the concept but not the protocol per se because it needs to be single leg We need to also use research that teaches us about cross-education. So making sure each leg is trained independently and not punishing your good leg by detraining it and trying to keep your weights even. So being evidence-based uses research but doesn't use one single paper or protocol or recipe. It's about incorporating what new knowledge that adds to me as a clinician. Yes, absolutely. And then just kind of look it up for all the different pieces and put them together and try to spot on make what works. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I just want to thank you so much, Ebony, for being here, taking the time to share your expertise. You just gave us a masterclass on treatment, tendinopathy. That was awesome. I I loved it. And I'm sure the audience loved too. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope everyone goes and does a set of calf raises today. (laughs) (laughs) If you haven't known, just get up and do it now. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you so much.